Okay, well, I'd like to introduce uh, the Bar Centre. Um, I first came across Bar uh, in a s small snippet in an English uh, newspaper saying that you'd been awarded 10 million from the Gates Foundation. So I investigated a little bit more and the more I read, uh, the more interested I became uh, because of the tremendous results that you're having um, in terms of um, engagement of otherwise unachieving um, children in, in your high schools. Um, that type of underachievement has plagued the British system for a very long time. And yet you seem to have cracked it with both secondary and primary schools. So um, your high school and elementary schools are now uh, secondary and primary. And the more I learned about it, the more I thought there must be lessons that could be applied to the English system and to schools worldwide, in fact. So um, this is why we've written some articles about you and why we're very keen to have you on this webinar, um, this webinar course. So the course is three webinars long. Uh, we're going to try and get into the nitty gritty of why you've been successful when so many others have failed. Um, and uh, I think there's, there's uh, going to be at some point in the future, very great interest. I think we're just the advanced guard. Um, so with that, I'd like to hand over to Angela Jerebeck, um, who's the founder of the Bar Approach. And um, she's going to introduce her team and the program for the three courses. Thanks, Angela. Well, thank you, Howard, for the introduction. And I'm going to give a fast handoff, actually, to Janice, who's going to give logistics. And then I'll go. But Janice, do you want to first kind of start? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Howard. And um, thank you to everyone for taking some time um, out of your week to join us. We really appreciate it. And we're excited to um, be able to join together to talk about um, what's going right in education this afternoon. Um, today we're going to be talking about why relationships matter. I am going to be your host for this series of webinars. I've been in education for almost 20 years and have had the privilege to work with our bar schools all over the United States. Um, during these webinars, we hope to be able to provide both a foundational research base for the importance of relationships, as well as practical tools that you can use in your practice. We are so thankful for the work that you are doing to support our global students and grateful for this time that you took to join us today. Presenting on the webinar today with me will be members of the BAR team and we will feature a BAR school in Minnesota. So I'd like to start off by just introducing you to the BAR team. Angela Jarabek, who you just met, is our executive director and founder. Dr. Anu Sharma is our senior research scientist. Rob Metz is our de deputy director. I am the director of schools. Beth Heimer is our Associate Director of Elementary Schools, and Christina Ritter is our Associate Director of Strategic Initiatives. We also have joining us Angie Ryder, who is the Assistant Principal at South St. Paul High School um, in St. Paul, Minneapolis. Um, just a few housekeeping items. We will stop several times throughout the webinar to take your questions, but if you have a question that you really want to ask, please, please feel free to type it in the chat box, come off mute and ask us. We have, you know, we're an intimate group here today, so we'd love to just be able to, to chat and, and really make sure you get the information that you're looking for. Um, this webinar is being recorded, so I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of that. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Angie Jarbeck. So once again, thank you all for, for being here. Um, a bit of the history of, of BAR, I actually developed the model when I was a high school counselor. And it was based because half of our ninth graders had failed at least one course for five years in a row. And I knew the kids were capable and I knew our staff was capable and I felt like it was the system that needed to be really revised. And so one of the, the notable differences about BAR is it has 22 years of research. So very beginning, we always had an external researcher with us, but really, once again, believe strong that BAR gives the educators the tools to work together and a very strength-based approach. So we're looking proactively and we're looking at the whole student. So in particular, looking at non-academic reasons, why students um, may be fa um, failing and not succeeding. I also wanna say 
in some ways, even if feeling that they're not reaching their full potential. So we're really looking in advance as a team to be able to, to get in front of that. All right, next slide, please. I think the, the piece that you'll have um, a lot of glimpse in, and this is the piece that we really wanna make sure that we're contributing is, we have just a ton of research. So we have done 12 within school randomized control trials. So we have gone to communities and asked the school to be willing to randomly assign their students to both teachers that were coaching and training, as well as to have them be working with kind of school as usual. And then at the end of that year, we compare those students. So we're not changing the curriculum. We're not changing the structure. We're really seeing what happens if you add the coaching and training to the current system. And then we're able to see these impacts. The other piece that's interesting is our, our intervention is not curriculum specific. So there's not going to be a math component or a reading component. But what you'll see is the impacts are math and reading. Our intervention itself is really how do you work to be them together better? And how do you make sure that you're using data in real times to be able to have the students be successful? So I think one of the big contributions is you're going to see how rigorous research designs are able to show causal nature of the relationships. So we're able to say with very high confidence that this model is in fact um, working. So besides the fact that we've got 170 schools with um, data that's coming from a variety of ways, we've got 12 from within school randomized control trials. And now we're also in the middle of a 66 between school randomized control trial. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our researcher who has been with us from the very beginning, Dr. Anu Sharma. Thank you so much, Angie. It is a pleasure to be here. Good day to all of you. I want to just um, add my welcome to uh, that of Angie and Janice and all of us at the Bar Center. Um, as Janice mentioned, my name is Anoush Sharma. I've had the great pleasure of being um, part of the evaluation team with Bar since its inception. In 1999, I was assigned by my supervisor the project of um, evaluating, quote unquote, the ninth grade program at a local secondary school. Little did I know that in 2020, I would be standing here, talk, sitting here, talking about um, 20 plus years of research undergirding that same model. And I want to say that at this time, and I assume this is true for most of you, what I'm hearing from family, friends, and neighbors is that relationships and data matter more than ever. And for those of us who work in school, we've always known that to be the case. With regard to relationships, we just know and feel in our hearts that students learn better when they're learning with someone. You know, that side by side, or I'm doing this for you because you care about me feeling. But one of the criticisms that we faced, for those of us who believe that, is from people who think that's fluff or feel good stuff, but not really evidence-based, that there's no data to back it up. But with BAR, I have to say that my experience has been otherwise. When you pay attention to relationships and you use data, that same data moves. And I will give you a few highlights, just a few, because we also want to um, stick with practicalities in our time together. But let me show you the science behind relationships in BAR, and then we will move to practice. Um, Ari, I'm actually going to have you move to the previous slide because I would like to emphasize the quote that um, was up when Angie was talking. This quote is a, is a brilliant statement. A growing body of research has demonstrated the effects of socio-emotional learning on school climate, student behavior, and student academic performance. But here's the rub. Critical to this discussion is the use of rigorous research designs that test the causal nature of this relationship. Now, the only way that the scientific model can attribute cause or causality is through randomized control trials, as Anshi mentioned. These are studies in which there's an experimental and control group and students are assigned at random to one of those two. They are extremely challenging to conduct in the real world of education, especially at the secondary level and very few have shown results. But BAR, with its foundation of data and relationships, has done so. Um, Ari, if you could move to the next slide, please. This is our research at a glance. Now, this is not the whole world of BAR by any means. Our research has focused primarily on ninth grade students, but primary and what we in the states called middle schools have also found these results to be applicable to their settings. And in fact, this isn't even all the students in um, the secondary schools that we work with. 
Rather, these are the numbers that are represented in our studies. We conducted 12 within-school randomized control trials in the United States, um, states of California, Minnesota, Kentucky, and Texas. 4,700 plus students and 149 teachers participated in these studies. And it's worth mentioning that the vast majority of students in these schools were students of color and eligible for our proxy for poverty, which is students eligible for free and reduced lunch in their school, in their school lunch program. And the students in each school, as I mentioned, were randomly assigned to one year bar or business as usual. And the measures we tested to see if bar students outperformed control students were credits earned, passing courses, standardized achievement test scores, and student and teacher perceptions. And at the bottom of this slide, um, you'll see a lot of acronyms, but these are what we call our validators. And that is organizations that have tested or reviewed our work and have in some way, shape, or form passed our work, endorsed it, or made statements about it. Um, next slide, please. This is the, the slide that shows how we had the confidence to attempt this. This is 20 years of data from St. Louis Park, the original school where Barb began, where Angie was a counselor. At St. Louis Park School, where Rob Metz, who actually will speak next, he was principal or headmaster at the time and later superintendent, the program helped close the achievement or what we now call in the US the opportunity gap. The dotted lines in the bar graph on the left represent Minnesota state averages. The solid lines represent the St. Louis Park students who received the bar model. You can see the solid blue line is always above the dotted blue line. Those are the lines for all students. Similarly, the solid red line is above the dotted red line. Those are lines for Black or African American students. So St. Louis Park students consistently outperform their Minnesota peers. But may I draw your attention to where the solid blue and red lines end up? They meet in 2017, meaning that Black or African American students did just as well, in fact, a bit better than their white counterparts. On the right, you'll see a slide that shows the number of advanced placement, AP, and international baccalaureate, IB tests that students took at the school. And these steadily increased over time. In fact, St. Louis Park received the award from American College Testing, or the ACT, several years ago for this very achievement. So our experience at St. Louis Park gave us the confidence to test the model elsewhere. And so we did. Um, next slide, please. Through funding from the United States Department of Education, and this funding was termed Investing in Innovation, or I3, we received something called a development grant. Now this funding was to develop further and test models that were showing promise in the field. We tested our model at Hemet High School. It's a suburban California high school outside Los Angeles. And those data are on these slides. I'm sorry, on, on this slide. The first graph on the left shows that failure rates went down over time, and they did so for all students and for Hispanic students. The second graph shows achievement test scores, standardized test scores on reading and math. The bar students in blue did better than the non-bar students in green. Um, next slide, please. After the results from that um, first high school, we received additional investment funds from the government, this time for what was called validation funds, to validate the model in other settings. We tested the model in 11 other schools. These bar graphs show that failure rates were lower for bar students who were dark blue than non-bar students in light blue. And that was true for the full sample and down the row, girls, boys, minority, and white students. So let's look at BAR a little bit more carefully. Next slide, please, Ari. How does BAR get these significant results? The American Institutes of Research, our external evaluator for these randomized control trials, conducted what's called a mediation analysis. Dr. Johannes Bose, the principal investigator, told us that it's really quite rare that the theory of change is even subjected to a test, let alone pass it, but this one was. Let's go through it. BAR gets results by working with teachers to change their attitudes. They feel increased self-efficacy, believing they can actually facilitate positive strength-based changes in their students. They feel supported by their administrators, and then they in turn change their own behaviors. 
we see enhanced collaboration, better use of data, and lo and behold, we see them creating positive intentional relationships with students. As a result, student attitudes change, moving down the line. Students themselves may feel more supported, they feel more as expected of them, and they feel more engaged in and excited about school. They in turn change their behaviors. They show up more, they have fewer issues, and better social emotional skills. And finally, we get academic outcomes, those prizes at the end of all this hard work. Students graduate at higher rates, they have better math and reading scores, they increase the number of credits they earn, and they pass core classes at higher rates. So it starts with teachers and ends with students. I'm gonna turn this over to my colleague and friend, Rob Metz, to talk about this um, model from a practitioner perspective. Good day, everyone. Thank you, Anu. My name is Rob Metz. I'm the Deputy Director of the Bar Center. And as Anu said, I'm a former elementary principal, high school principal, and superintendent, and was fortunate enough to be an elementary principal, high school principal, and superintendent in the district where Bar started. I was not there when it started, but I came in and learned a great deal about Bar and how it works. Um, I love this slide because as a school administrator, this tells the entire story for me, that the learning process in a bar school moves from left to right. I can tell you that as a, a former high school principal, before I knew about bar, I would start on the right-hand side of this chart. If I wanted a higher math score for the students in my high school, I would start on the right-hand side of the chart and I would change math curriculums, or I would change teacher evaluation systems or I would change the grading system. And I can't tell you how many schools over the years I've seen change math curriculums three, four, five times, and it doesn't change their math outcomes one bit because they're starting on the right-hand side of the chart. People tell us, how did our math scores go up? Like we didn't change our math curriculum. We didn't change our math teachers. We didn't change our math students, but our math scores went up. And it's because they started on the left-hand side of this chart. So as Anu said, uh, where bar starts is by changing teacher attitudes, which leads to changing teacher behaviors, which leans, leads to student attitudes changing, which leads to their behaviors changing, which results in academic outcomes. If I was teaching a college class to administrators, this would be the first day of the first course teaching them this chart because I can tell you people in my generation, we never saw this and we never understood this. I bet you could pull a lot of, uh, a lot of experienced high school administrators and they would start on the right hand side of the chart. They were never taught this. And to me, this is the gold mine of bar, the idea of moving from left to right and getting academic outcomes as a product of the change in teacher attitudes, teacher behaviors, student attitudes, and student behaviors. When our coaches coach a school, they coach teachers, and we measure outcomes with students. So we definitely move left to right, and that's why we're so successful. Um, with that, I will stop and want to give us time to answer any questions that may have come up so far on this webinar. And Janice is going to facilitate a short question and answer time before we move on. Yes, any questions that have come up so far um, as you've seen our research in this first portion of the webinar? You know, I want to draw attention to just one thing that Anu had referenced. Um, our reference of the opportunity gap as compared to the achievement gap is because our belief is very strongly that the achievement gap at times is really putting the um, uh, blame on the individual student versus on the system. So when we really believe that all of the students are capable, we believe that there's an opportunity gap because the system needs to be um, uh, redesigned and looked at versus the achievement gap that once again puts the onus on the student who's not achieving. So um, we had talked about this with Howard a number of times and wanted to share that, that this has become 
um, the way we phrase the work and a number of organizations phrase the work that we need to close the opportunity gap so that subsequently all students are able to um, yield similar successes versus an achievement gap, which once again has implications that the individual student is not achieving. Thank you, Angie, for um, pointing, drawing attention to that. Um, yes. Okay. Um, I understand about a randomized controlled trial and, uh, and that you select some teachers. How in a secondary setting um, do you select teachers um, for, I mean, they're going to be, if it's anything like the UK system, I'm sure it is, teachers teach subjects and therefore they're teaching children across a range of year groups and teaching their subjects. So how do you ensure that they only interact with the children that are in the random controlled trial? Um, Anu, do you, Anu, do you mind answering that from a, from a evaluation standpoint, but then Janice was actually at a school that did a randomized control trial. So I think she could also talk about it from being a teacher there. But Anu, do you want to start that? Um, I, the first thing I want to say is that, um, and I hope I, I, if I didn't state this correctly, I apologize, that we only randomize the students. We don't randomly assign the teachers. So that's the first clarification. In um, secondary schools, you very rarely have the luxury of randomly assigning teachers because teachers have licensure issues. And um, just as you mentioned, Sue, they are teaching certain subjects. So we randomize the students only. And um, Janice, I, I will let you just talk about the, you're talking about the crossover and the, or Sue, are you also talking about um, teachers interact, you said teachers interacting only with the students that they're um, supposed to interact with. So you're talking about crossover? Yeah, because I mean, I'm, I've been involved in random control trials uh, myself and it's extremely difficult to isolate the variables um, in a secondary context because so you, you can't be certain, that, how can you be certain that the students that you put into the trial um, don't get access to the teachers who've had the training. Okay. You know, oh, Go ahead, Janice. I can imagine that would be incredibly complex. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you justify, if you're sure it's going to work, that you don't give it to all children? Yeah, I, I think you ask a lot of great questions. I can tell you've definitely been involved in randomized control trials. Um, so my high school um, that I used to teach at did the randomized control trial. And so um, when we asked that, AAR does the random assignment of the students who um, the school has no say in which team they're assigned to. Um, and so we asked that, um, you know, you have a core group of teachers that are teaching these students. Um, and so in my school, um, the school actually had them on separate sides of the building <laughs> to, to avoid any um, what we called crossover. We very quickly realized by November, um, the students that were in bar had missed half as many days of school as the students who were not receiving the bar treatment. I very quickly, I very clearly remember we had a staff meeting with our principal and, and the administrators involved in bar we said, hey, we got to get this to all kids. We, we know we said we're in a study, but we got to get this to all kids. And he said, you guys, this is the whole point of the study. Like we have to prove that this works so that we can get it to all kids around the country, not this one group of kids that aren't getting it right now. So it does provide a bit of a moral quandary, as you cited, that you know that it works. For us, it proved it worked very quickly. Um, and we couldn't wait until the next year when we could get it to all kids. The district that I'm in is now doing bar from sixth grade through ninth grade because of how well it worked with that original small group. Um, but we made sure that those, those kids were not crossing over from teachers to teachers. So our 12 schools that did randomized control trials took that very seriously and did not have students crossing between those teachers. 
You know, Sue, I'll add one other piece in um, because I often was the person talking to the, the superintendent about this, you know, in terms of this moral quandary. And what we had shared is many schools rarely can roll things out seamlessly to all students. So for example, if technology comes in, rarely can all students get it at the exact same time. And so what we were asking them to do is basically have this be a rollout, but have it be controlled. And, and to the point, the school, if it did not work, did not have to continue it. If it did work, we would know scientifically that it worked, not only for that school, but much more broadly. So I presented to, to many school leaders to, and to, to say this. Now, Janice's school actually was able to keep things much more clean in terms of the study than others. AIR has said repeatedly that our impacts actually are reported as less than what happened because our bar teachers absolutely in, intervened and used strategies with the control students by the end. So we have a lot of documentation showing that the control students actually did better also at the end of the year than just the bar students. So we try to minimize as much as possible, but we know we had contamination that was occurring. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm, I seem to be hogging. I just want to ask one more question. Um, in my experience of introducing a new strategy into school where only some teachers get the input, it creates a bar, a barrier for differences between those teachers who are getting this and are changing the way they operate and changing their relationships and those teachers in the school who don't get it, especially if the children are clearly benefiting just from attendance alone, that would, uh, that would lead the other teachers to start to worry about what it was they were doing. You know, and it leads, it could, it leads to, um, yeah, difficulties between the teachers. I'll start this a little bit and then actually I feel like Angie Ryder will be able to help and she talks about this too. So she's at another school. One of the pieces is many of our schools, even when they're not participating in randomized control trials, prefer to start off with a small group of teachers. Um, because back to your point, at times it's difficult to, teachers, to get teachers to buy in to do something new, just to call that like it is, having been an educator for over 20 years myself. When they hear the model and they hear it's about relationships and data, they often dismiss it back to a news point. They'll be like, I'm doing relationships and data. Why, why would you think I would need training on this? So by starting intentionally, it's one of the learnings we had from our randomized control trials. We have huge school systems we're working with, and it is not uncommon that that first year starts off with three or four staff. What happens is they can then show the effectiveness, they can tell their colleagues, and it grows internally versus having it to be an external mandate. So um, that one of the learnings of actually having to only go to a, a small group actually ended up be a way that we're entering a lot of the school systems. And we tell our schools, we just need a team of you to start and let's just start from there. And then you grow the momentum because the other piece is almost all of our schools that have started this model have never stopped. It's not a program that comes in and out. It is a way of doing schools. So back to the first school that did it, this has been 22 years and this is just the way they operate. You know, um, Janice, once again, is in the, the state of Maine and her school was an early school to do it. Now every county in the state of Maine has a bar school. So it does just become a way of operation, which is what our goal is, but how you enter is an important piece. Yeah. Okay. So obviously, if you've only got three or four teachers, the children are not only being taught by four teachers, they're being taught by other teachers as well. Do you have any idea what the minimum number of bar teachers is necessary for students to show a difference? No. And Nu, I'll give this as a statistic, I mean, thing. we always say that we, we would, the goal is we need to have a whole student view and we believe that three teachers, regardless of content, or Can three adults, is the, the ability to, to do that. But Anu, from a scientific standpoint, what are your thoughts? I think that's more of a program implementation. 
I think um, I think it's it's as you said, the model requires that, and we haven't yet described exactly the the program itself. Yeah. So some of these questions may um, yeah. be answered a little bit as we go into the model itself. But we do group teachers into groups of teams of. Uh, three or four teachers based on the core subject areas, and then those teachers deliver the impact. And we believe that you need three or four because of the, if students are going to graduate on time, they need competencies in three or four areas, English, what we call social studies or civics, um, mathematics, and um, science. So we, we need those three or four core teachers to be involved in the model. Thank you. I'm just going to interrupt for one second and ask if, if when you're not speaking, if you could just please mute. We're getting some feedback. It's a little bit hard to hear everyone. Thank you. There is one other question about um, research in the chat box, and that is how do you assess elementary school changes? Mm -hmm. So we, I think we can um, address some of those. I'll have a new um, go on this one a little bit, but I think other pieces will talk about elementary a bit. Um, our work started at the secondary level because of the success. Our, we now have elementary models that are taking this on, but we are really looking at a whole student um, and a thriving student approach. Anu, do you want to talk a little bit about some of those markers? Hope you're on mute, Anu. Thank you. We, I was paying attention to Janice. <laughs> Um, we don't have the level of data at the elementary level that we do at the secondary. What we're finding at the elementary level is that we need to have two separate kinds of indicators. We need to have something in the socio-emotional domain and something in the academic domain. And the ac academic domain could be academic slash behavioral attendance or something of that vein. So we're still exploring, but basically what we want to do, because many of the elementary um, schools that we work with don't even give grades. They, um, they have different ways of um, assessment or different ways of achieving. And we don't really want to rely on year by year assessment processes because that is not enough time for change to be evidenced within a school year. We want students to change quickly and rapidly within a school year, not at the end of the year. So we're looking at a number of different measures, but basically the premise that we're operating on is something that is important to the school. Whatever is important to the school, we wanna do that academically and socio-emotionally. But it's a much more um, individualized and uh, pertinent to the school climate and school context itself. And so when we get to the elementary portion, we can talk about the elementary schools that we're working with now and what they're prioritizing. But I think a news delineation is really important that our elementary schools are always looking at two um, categories of data, not as a end result, but as an operational way to assess students' health. Janice, I'm gonna give it back to you. All right. Um, if you have other questions, please feel free to keep um, popping in them in the chat box. We will um, have another small um, break later where we'll, where we'll take some more questions. Thank you for all of those thoughtful questions. We really appreciate your engagement. We want to get a little bit into the meat of um, relationships and data. Um, and I want to introduce you to a little bit to our two, what we call our two pillars, um, relationships and data. Um, there are also three types of relationships that are keystone to school culture, staff to staff, staff to student, and student to student. We'll be discussing each of these in depth throughout this um, series of webinars. And then the other pillar is data. Data is both hard data, attendance, discipline, test scores, grades, but then also the softer data. Has the student lost weight? Have they changed friend groups? How is their general well-being? So let's, let's look at these three types of relationships. And then today specifically, we're gonna talk about staff to staff more in depth. Uh, many times when we think of relationships in schools, we think of that, that staff to student relationship, which is absolutely critical and we have to be developing that relationship. And as staff members, we have to be modeling what healthy relationships look like for our students, knowing that this might be the only place that they are seeing that modeling happening. It's also vital that we care for our well-being, especially during these really difficult times. If, if our cup is not full, we cannot fill students' cup. And so it's really important that we're both taking care of ourselves and reaching out to our colleagues to care for our colleagues. Um, doing this work alone can be exhausting. 
And VAR really breaks down those silos. You're gonna hear from Angie Ryder here in a few minutes to talk about how VAR breaks down those silos and really creates a team of support for kids. Just to give you a quick introduction to what you're gonna hear later this week about staff to student and student to student relationships. Staff to student relationships must be positive, intentional relationships. Each and every student that comes through our doors must have a positive, intentional relationship with an adult. This is the beauty of a team, because if you don't connect with every student on your team, as long as one adult is connecting with them, we're ensuring that each student has a connection. We know that if students have a connection to an adult in the building or are involved in an extracurricular activity, their chances of dropping out are drastically reduced. And then finally, student to student. Um, these, are, these are also very important and the third part of ensuring that you have a healthy um, school culture. As school and classroom leaders, we can help the students to understand the importance of these relationships, how to form and nurture them through social emotional lessons and by the example that we are setting for them. Uh, so today, as I said, we're going to dive into staff to staff relationships. And Angie Ryder is the assistant principal at South St. Paul High School. Um, and has been doing bar for, for quite a while. And she's gonna speak to you about how they have built intentional staff to staff relationships um, by using bar at their school. Angie. Hi, uh, Angie Ryder, assistant principal. Uh, we are actually a 612 building uh, and we are a full MYP uh, DP, full IB district. We've been doing um, the diploma program since 1986 and we were fully authorized as the building in 2008. Um, and so we're finding that that bar is uh, is making a big difference for our, our ninth graders. We were first trained. We started with one small team of three teachers in 2016. So we did our initial implementation training um, in 2016, and then in the 2017-2018 school year, we had one team of ninth graders. So three teachers and about 150 students. Um, and I think to Sue's question about did the other teachers feel bad they weren't doing it? No, uh, they were thankful they didn't have to do it. We get a lot of uh, initiative fatigue and it's really hard to get our adults to change. And so the starting small um, allowed some of our teachers to, to really get a feel for how things were working. And then we've been slowly growing since, since then. So that second year then we had two ninth grade teams, uh, a full team and then a team of teachers who had four sections of ninth graders and one um, section of something else. And one of the first uh, changes I saw in a staff member was during that second and third year of bar implementation. Um, she's a dear friend of mine, Carrie, is a 28 year veteran. And over the years has become more and more dis disillusioned, uh, quite frankly, to the point of bitterness. Um, I think she had really forgotten why she was a teacher. And it was, uh, she was fire sailing kids out of her classroom. And she just, a kid, her patience was non-existent. Um, and that first year that she was on a bar team, she was really skeptical, didn't really buy in, didn't really um, join the process. It kind of tried to shoot holes into, or poke holes into everything that we were doing. And as we started to, get better at running the agenda and making sure we stayed focused on what bar was really about. Um, she started to change. She became a little less bitter that first year, um, a little more engaged, a little more patient with kids, you know, and it was a slow roll with her. And then last year, um, it's like she's a, she was a whole new teacher. She is actually now uh, a member of our Gates uh, NSI team and has become probably the most vocal proponent for bar she is advocating um, and lobbying our school board and our superintendent to make sure that uh, in these times of, of financial difficulty and budget cuts that they are not short se uh, selling bar she's personally text messaging our, our superintendent i think maybe he might regret that he gave her uh, his, the phone number um, but she is texting him regularly to remind him how important it is that we continue to have uh, support for BAR and that we continue this program that has shown great success with our kids. Um, our 
current juniors, so 11th graders, um, really struggled. They were the first group to have, a, have two full bar teams. In eighth grade, they were at a 55% failure rate. Uh, and in the, by the end of ninth grade, we were down to a 28% failure rate with that group. I mean, it was just, it was astounding, the, the changes uh, that we made with that group. But watching Carrie just kind of come alive and become more flexible with kids, um, I think she might actually be able to finish her career as a teacher. I was, I was really worried for a while that she was not going to be able to do that. Uh, but the change in her and, and the pushing that she's doing on other staff to get them to, to join along has been really exciting to see. Um, one of the other things that I've really noticed uh, with staff is that the structure is allowing for more support. So we've got younger teachers who are becoming leaders. And I'm going to kind of, the, the two bullet points, uh, young teacher and the team support. Uh, Des is a, Desiree is a third year teacher and she is part of our maroon team. So we have two ninth grade teams and they are the younger of the team. The most experienced teacher on that team is a fourth year teacher. And they are by far the most functional of the two teams. And quite frankly, more functional, I think, than our middle school teams who are, who've been working together for a really long time. And part of that is because Des has been given a platform to really develop as a leader. The ability to follow the agenda, to make sure that you're always starting with the positives, that is, has been a key. Um, as a third year teacher, we tapped her to kind of sell, we've had the opportunity to become a, a full bar district. Both of our elementary schools and our middle school are going to receive bar training. And she was really an important piece of that puzzle we had uh, Desiree and Carrie both come and speak to our elementary principals and our middle school principals because they were really balking at the idea that we should add another, again, another initiative as they saw it to, to the district. And so having uh, a, a third year teacher and a 28 year veteran both really selling this program um, has, is getting everyone else on board. She is now speaking up in larger groups that the first two years, very quiet. She has incredible insight and lots of really good things to say. And in years past, we would not have heard from her for another four or five years, probably. That's just kind of the culture that we have. Uh, we are a, a relatively small town in a, in, a suburb, in a very urban area. We're a first ring suburb. And we've got people who have been here a very long time. And it's not always easy to step up and be a leader in this district. So to watch her have a platform and to really move forward and, and grow her team and grow her voice has been exciting to see. Um, and as part of her, te her team, um, that functioning Maroon team are collaborating together. And it's really powerful to watch them talk about students, having each of them get to know students at different, um, in different ways so that they're better able to connect with the kids. It's also really uh, exciting to walk into a science class and hear the science teacher talking about what's happening in the social studies or the individuals and societies class. And that ability to have that connection between the teachers so that the kids know that science isn't a standalone, that everyone is talking to each other um, has been really powerful. And the team, is supporting each other. So if someone's having a bad day or having a rough time with a kid, the teachers talk to each other and get support from one another in a way that they hadn't before we implemented BAR in our 912 building. Um, just watching the growth and watching the change in the adults has been really exciting. Um, we we're able, fortunate enough this year to have full implementation training for all teachers grades nine through 12. And I think some of the most powerful things that I've heard, um, veteran teachers 30, 35 years in our district who have said that what we did in August was by far the best training that they've had as an opening days training in their career. Uh, we had a teacher who's been here for seven years who said, why haven't we been doing this all along? This has taken everything that we've tried to do and put it into one package. And what I am finding is, as everyone is, so we've got 55, 60 staff members, 
and I'm watching the climate of the building change. I'm watching the teachers uh, talk to each other differently. I'm watching the teachers hold each other accountable in a way that they never have before. The, the structure of always starting in a meeting with something positive uh, gets things off on the right foot. And what I'm, what I'm hearing and when I'm stepping into meetings to listen, when a teacher kind of goes off the rails or doesn't follow along with the agenda or starts to go down that road of, of bitterness, I'm watching staff pull them back in and not let them kind of go rogue and take everybody down that, that darker path. And so that's been a really exciting thing to see, especially because right now it's so difficult. We've got some kids here two days a week and some kids here not at all and everything is so chaotic in this current um, world situation that having but like I see a light at the end of the tunnel and the, the growth and development that I'm seeing amongst the adults who have been here, you know, I've been here 25 years, the growth I've seen in the last four months is unbelievable. The positivity um, when it's so easy right now to really go negative and go dark, I'm watching teachers rally each other in a way that they hadn't done before. Uh, and I, I, I attribute that fully to Barr, and I'm really excited about the fact that our other buildings can kind of take advantage of that as well. I think it's really going to to continue to help us turn a corner in the way that our adults interact with each other. And that, I think, is all the stories that I have. And I've got, um, it, it's just, I, I drank the Kool-Aid, if you understand that reference, uh, if you're of a certain age. Um, I drank the Kool-Aid and I have fully bought in and I'm really excited to be a part of this organization. I was really honored when they, they tapped us to, to talk about what was happening in our buildings because it is really exciting stuff. And with that, if there were, I think a question came up in the chat and I don't know if that was for me or not, but um, I'd like to introduce Beth Heimer next and she's going to be sharing stories of, of elementary bar. Thank you, Angie. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Beth Heimer, and I'm going to touch on some different pieces of the Bar Elementary model. In terms of the staff-to-staff -staff relationships, one of the key components and benefits of Bar is the systems and structures that they have in place around block meetings. Very often, elementary teachers are siloed in their classroom each year with their own students and don't necessarily have a network of people to work with. The Bar system creates a team of grade level teachers, as well as a team of multi grade level teachers, as well as specialists and interventionists. So now the approach is not, how are we going to help my student, but how are we going to help support and intervene with our student? With the group team approach, we have a sharing of academic resources. For example, there could be a second grade student that is really struggling with their literacy skills. And at a block meeting that is shared, and through that, we have first grade teachers sharing instructional resources or tools that they have used in the past that were successful, and or a sharing of students, having second grade students come down and work with first grade students to help booster their confidence, as well as work on some of those baseline um, approaches to learning. There also is the SEL component where we're always leaning into student strengths. And if there's a sharing of a common issue in terms of some of the students, but we're able to lean into that find that their strength was in arts. They're very creative. They like to express themselves through different mediums. We can have counselors and mental health specialists create groups of students to be able to work with them, but in an environment of leaning into their strengths with art and having an art group around the lunchtime for them to work with each other. At times, there was the approach of what is it going to do a benefit to a student if I'm in a meeting about a student that I may never teach or I haven't taught or I might not even have interaction with in the school environment. And what I would share is uh, there was a fifth grade team that was having a meeting and one of the fifth grade teachers was sharing that one of her students um, seemed to be suddenly withdrawn and she noticed that her peer relationships were not what they were before. 
she had reached home and had found that there was also possibly some issues in her home environment that was causing the student some anxiety and stress. And as she was sharing her concerns about the student, and as a group, they were trying to come up with a goal and some interventions to help support the student at this time. One of the fifth grade teachers made a comment that he would have never have noticed that or known that because of how she presented herself in the hallway at her locker, at lunch, etc. But he said, even though I don't teach her, and I actually don't even teach on the same floor where her classroom is, I'm going to make an effort that when I do see her, I'm going to make an effort to come down and reach out to her and say hello to her when she's at her locker. Make a note of saying goodbye to her at the bus dismissal line making note of any time that I see her reaching out so that she is being seen and feeling heard and feeling valued by at least another adult in the school. So something so small as one other individual being aware of what a student might be going through and the impact that that could have on that student is quite powerful when you look at that cumulative effect of every adult in the school and every student in the school. The next slide. I love this quote in that it was shared from a behavior interventionist who in the past uh, liked to really work siloed, um, really liked to rely upon his own approach and his own method with the students. And after using BAR and being, having going through the BAR implementation program, his quote is, one of the things that BAR has made me more aware of during the start of this school year with COVID being present is relationships, seeing the whole child. For me right now, it's all about intentionally building a relationship. Wearing a mask has its barriers, but being fully present when talking with staff and especially with students, because I only get to see them twice a week, has brought this to my immediate way of communicating. It's also a trust issue. But before I can earn their trust, I must first build a connection with that person. And it's through a relationship that I can strive to do this. Two words, intentional relationships. Any questions? And actually, I was going to give this to Janice. Thank you, Beth, Beth and others. But Janice, do you want to give a little bit of an overview of the model and then facilitate some more questions before we kind of wrap up with some resources? Um, so I, I think one thing that Beth said resonated with me in thinking about the whole model that it's not, you know, it's not my student, it's our student. Um, and when thinking about using these pillars of data and relationships, it really is about collaborative problem solving as we work together as a staff. Um, so some of the ways that we do that, you heard Beth mention block meeting. Um, and that's when a group of teachers come together on a weekly basis to collaboratively um, discuss students in a strength-based way. Um, so we always start with a strength. And think of it often like a puzzle. We each bring a piece of that puzzle and until we're all together sitting in a positive collaborative setting, we don't really see the whole puzzle emerge. So we don't know what that student fully looks like. Um, and then we're doing goal setting and, and interventions. And then we're following up on that week after week to ensure that that student is starting to see success. We also do what we call I times at the secondary level and U times at the elementary level. This is our socio-emotional um, curriculum. And the purpose of that is to, to continue to build those relationships. So they do it with each of their core teachers on a rotating basis. So they're doing it in science, in math, in social studies, in English, and they're really building those relationships with those teachers. And then for students that, um, that we continue to work with but need more resources, we have what we call risk review. And they, that, this group is also meeting on a weekly basis. And this is really a group that engages with the community to find community supports and help students with things that the teachers don't necessarily have the resources to help them with, like homelessness or substance abuse or um, those, those really um, deep issues that we have to get um, external help for. And so those, those key pieces are working together to ensure that our staff is able to support both each other and to support our students um, on a regular basis.
And Angie um, Ryder just put in the chat box, ITEPs can be aligned to approaches to learning skills in the IB program if you're an IB school. Any other questions? And then we have one um, resource that we want to give you today to take with you. Okay, I will pass it over to Christina. Thank you, Ari. Can you let me share? There you go. Thanks. So I am going to share my screen. Thank you. So um, before I begin, I, was, I would like to walk us through how this resource came about and just a bit of background information. In planning for this year, we assembled task forces to zero in on creating additional resources that support the work of BAR and our focus on a strength-based approach. One of our task forces centered their work on supplementary ways to further improve staff-to-staff -staff relationships. <clears throat> the priority of the task force was to assist staff so that they come back healthy and supported and to provide resources to the staff so that they could continue to prioritize relationships throughout the year. The goal was to provide a go-to toolkit for teachers that fills the gap in the resources that are available. Currently, very little is out there with practical strategies for teachers to draw from, and this toolkit provides those ideas in a consolidated and user-friendly space. As we take a quick tour through this visually engaging document, you will notice there are embedded hyperlinks for easy access and use. Also peppered throughout the document are uplifting quotes that serve as reminders of keeping the focus on the focus. The document is divided into four areas. Part one, starting the year strong. This section contains a back to school onboarding checklist for teachers. Part two is an activities menu and contains a list of activities for educators to draw from and navigating the school year. Part three focuses on using social emotional learning curriculum. As Janice mentioned earlier, U times or I times, these lessons written by BAR are used with students, but can also be used with adults to foster relationships and connections among staff. Part four contains a list of source material for the suggestions and information shared in the toolkit. I'm going to zero in on this, if you'll just give me a second, just so you can see it a little bit better. So in part one checklist for teachers, the list was, was designed to help teachers by providing a number of items to consider and accomplish as teachers start the year. Although the year has begun, the list is still useful as it provides suggestions teachers can use to feel more confident and prepared, regardless of the operational setting of the school. At the bottom of the screen is one example of a suggestion on remaining connected with others. In this suggestion, educators are encouraged to build social networks and communities. Embedded in the document is a hyperlink to a free communication resource called Slack. Remaining in communication with colleagues, whether socially or in regard to work, in, in regard to work-related topics, is important. And finding ways that are not cumbersome for educators is key to keeping lines of communication open. I would also like to highlight another suggestion in the checklist. And as you see me scroll through the document, you see there are several suggestions listed. Almost there. Given the importance of relationships and social emotional learning, there's a recommendation to self-reflect on your comfort level and skill in meeting students' SEL needs. In this suggestion are two embedded hyperlinks to tools that may be used to gauge your comfort and skill level. The first link takes you to a framework and process for reflecting on personal, social, and emotional growth. The second hyperlink, SEL through distance learning, teacher self-assessment, provides a checklist for teachers to assess their strengths and areas of growth as it pertains to promoting SEL through distance learning. Part two and three, which we I'm scrolling to, contains an activities menu that provides a list of activities for educators to draw from. The list includes self-care and stress management, cultivating connection with colleagues, 
engaging meetings from near and far, and using iTimes, our SEL curriculum with adults. In regard to self-care and stress management, educators are encouraged to ask themselves the following questions. What will help me to minimize the stress I am experiencing? What makes my heart, body, mind, and or soul feel refreshed? And they are also encouraged to remember that self-care doesn't have to be time intensive. Ideas for promoting self-care are provided as small notes that are sprinkled throughout the next few pages. Suggestions such as identify at least three activities that bring you joy, set self-care goals, and as I scroll to another page, reorganize your desk or work workspace so it feels less cluttered, um, are just a few of the many recommendations on these pages. If these aren't enough and you've tried all of these and have worked through them, we also provide a hyperlink to an additional resource for additional ideas. The section, this section of the toolkit, um, we have a colleague who uses the phrase a space and grace, talks and attends to the ideas that can be given that allow for you to give yourself grace. The next section, as I'm sorry, as I'm quickly going through this in the interest of time, is about cultivating engaging meetings whether you're near or, or far from one another. And it draws our attention to simple ways that despite the meeting setting, there is room for community building. This page lists suggestions such as icebreaker questions, setting meetings with mindset check-ins, and creating house rules. House rules are agreed upon expectations for how teams will operate throughout the year. And this is important given whether you are in the school building or working from home. Part three of the document is devoted to SEL lessons. I'm oh, sorry, I'm, I'm skipping ahead. Part three of the document is devoted to SEL lessons that can be used with adults. These fun-filled activities provide an opportunity for staff to connect in new and different ways. As you see here, um, BAR has created three volumes of lessons and various lessons have been pulled out that can be used with staff to foster staff to staff connections. Lastly, is our reference page of material. Uh, this lists all of the materials that have been provided in this document. You will receive this free resource after today's presentation and we hope that you're able to use a few or many of the ideas and suggestions in this toolkit. Our BAR team had fun developing a resource that helps educators create space for self-care and intentional connection with colleagues. At this time, I'll turn it over to Janice who will facilitate questions about the document. Thank you, Christina. Um, we'll give Ari a moment to reshare re her screen. Um, and we, we wanted to take any final questions that, that you might have. We will be sending you out that um, educator toolkit um, as a resource um, from us today that you can use um, with your staff. Um, we have had a very trying time here in the United States. And so one of our focuses has really been um, ensuring that our teachers are taking care of themselves. Um, and so um, our, our teachers have been really trying to use this toolkit um, and, and make sure that, that we're taking care of ourselves, putting that oxygen mask on first before we um, try to put it on someone else. So we hope that you find that helpful also. But happy to take any questions about any of the presentation today. All right. Well, hearing none, we would like to thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we will be back on Wednesday um, and we will be focusing on staff to student relationships on Wednesday. Um, so we hope that we will see you again then. Thank you so much for joining us.
Thank you, Daniel. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Howard. We'll see you on uh, on Wednesday, and I think um, we'll be able to keep the time. But I'll I will email you. Okay, so you're okay to keep the time with the same as today. Yeah, let me let me confirm with my team, and I'll be back to you um, shortly about that. Okay, great. Um, so as for the resources, um, are you going to send them on to me, and then I'll pass them on to the attendees? Yes, that would be wonderful. And I know we had a few people that weren't on your original list. Would it be possible also to get their their names and associations or? Yeah, you can do. I think they were mostly from um, Howard himself. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'll send you the, the list of everybody. Thank you. All, All right, well, everyone. Thanks, Sue, for asking great questions. Appreciate it. Thank you for the presentation and see you on Wednesday. All right. Bye-bye.